Let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Now, this is uh, another passage in the Word of God about the will of God uh, in the Word of God. And we saw last week that it is God's will uh, to abstain from fornication. It's God's will uh, to be sanctified. And the Bible is very, very clear that it's always God's will to be a, a, a pure person. So we read about it again here in Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 3 through 6. So let's everybody get our Bibles. And it's Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 3 through 6. So let's get our Bibles. Let's stand. Let's everybody join in in the reading of God's Word. It's Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3. Amen. Together now. But fornication. Amen. You may be uh, seated and keep your finger there because that's where we want to concentrate this morning and uh, look at that passage in the Word of God, Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 3 uh, through 6 as we study uh, the Word of God. Now, uh, what we're dealing with is the subject of prayer. Now, in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14, the Bible says this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything, you see, according to His will. Not according to our will, but His will. Now, as we study the New Testament, we find that the New Testament is filled with that phrase, this is the will of God. So God's will is not something that we can't get a hold of or know. But in 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything, say, according to His will, then the, uh, the next clause there says, He heareth us. That, now, that means that when you and I pray, if we do not pray according to the will of God, then God will not hear our prayer. Now, obviously, if He doesn't hear our prayer, He will never answer our prayer. But you see, the Bible is very, very clear that unless you and I pray according to the will of God, God will not hear our prayer. So the prayer will never be answered unless it's prayed in the will of God. Now, as we pointed out very clearly, say the will of God is found in the Word of God. See, over and over again, we have that phrase in the Bible, this is the will of God, or the will of God. As we mentioned last week, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3, uh, that paragraph there, 1 Thessalonians uh, 4, 3 through 8, see, it begins by saying, this is the will of God. Now, there are many aspects to the will of God, and we'll be getting into that as we study the Word of God. Many things the Bible says specifically about the will of God. In fact, there's a lot more verses about the will of God than anybody ever dreamed about in uh, the New Testament. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3, he says, for this is the will of God. This is not the will of Paul. This is not the will of some preacher, but this is the will of God. Even your sanctification that you should abstain from fornication. And uh, so uh, what we have there in that paragraph in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 are eight Bible reasons why every child of God ought to live 
a morally pure life. You have eight reasons there. We pointed those out uh, last uh, Sunday uh, morning. Now, we also mentioned last week, and something we want to encourage all of us with, is some um, helpful verses to help us make right choices in relation to the matter of impurity. Now, uh, there are three verses I'd encourage everybody to memorize. And so when you have a question about, is this uh, moral? Is this impure? Is this uh, a temptation towards uh, impurity in my life? See, then we need to take out these uh, three verses and mention these verses. Why? See, Jesus overcame temptation by the Word of God, by using the Word of God. Now, we mentioned last week we cannot help the birds from flying over our head, but uh, we certainly can uh, stop them from building a nest in our hair. The birds flying over our head is temptation. Nobody lives without temptation or above temptation. Even the Lord Jesus was tempted, and that's why we need uh, ammunition of the Word of God in our lives. Now, Matthew 5 and verse 8. Somebody want to quote Matthew 5, 8? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, you need to memorize that verse. It's Matthew 5 and verse 8. And then the second verse we mentioned last week that we all need to memorize is 1 Peter 1, 16. Be ye holy for I am holy. And then the third verse was Philippians 4 and verse 8. Whatsoever things are pure, think on these things. See, whatsoever things are pure. And those three verses memorized will help all of us to live a pure life and a life that honors the Lord Jesus Christ in the matter, uh, in this uh, area. Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 1 Peter 1, 16, be ye holy, for I am holy. Philippians 4, 8, whatsoever things are pure, think on these things. Now, this morning I want to look in the book of Ephesians. Now, uh, just about all of the New Testament epistles have a section in the epistle on the matter of purity. And uh, here is uh, another great passage in the Bible, and it's Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 3 uh, through 6. Now, this is another, again, detailed passage in the epistles concerning the matter of sexual sin, or in a positive way, how to live a pure life. Now, I have a couple of uh, quotes here that I want to quote that indicate that, see, we think we are living in an impure, difficult day today. Now, the thing to keep in mind, in the New Testament, it was worse in relation to the matter of purity, fornication, adultery, and homosexuality than it is today. You say, Pastor, it's pretty uh, bad today. It was worse in the New Testament. Now, I have somebody here who uh, did a lot of background material in the New Testament era. And uh, he says here, the Greek word for fornication originally uh, denoted the practice of consor uh, consorting with prostitutes, but it came to signify any form of sexual sin. Um, the Gentile world, say, of Paul's day, regarded this sin as a matter of moral indifference, and it was indulged in without scruple by all classes of people. Uh, infidelity in marriage was frightfully common. Homosexuality had for centuries been the accepted way of life. Some of the great pagan temples were staffed by hundreds of priestess who uh, were nothing more than religious prostitutes placed there for the use of the men who came to offer their licentious worship to heathen deities. Now, see, that helps us to understand what was going on in the background of the books of Galatians and Ephesians and Romans and uh, these New Testament books that we read about in the New Testament. Now, 
Another scholar said this. Now, I want to bring this out so we might understand the people to whom Paul and the New Testament preachers uh, were writing to. Now, this uh, scholar says, in Paul's day, as in ours, sexual promiscuity was taken for granted. Everybody indulged in it. Imagine that. See, in the New Testament days, the writer says here, everybody indulged in, sec uh, in uh, sexual sin. So he goes on and he says, it was an acceptable lifestyle. So both of these scholars say, say in the New Testament, the people that uh, Peter, James, John, Paul, and so forth were dealing with, say this was common in the society. Now, does that uh, help us to understand why in the epistles you read so much about this subject in the epistles? Because see, it was commonplace. Now, uh, many of Paul's heathen converts had been brought up in a permissive atmosphere, atmosphere where it was common for a man to keep a mistress. That was common in the New Testament for a man to keep a mistress. Uh, frequent houses of ill uh, repute uh, gratify his lust in casual liaisons or accept uh, a partner without bothering with the formality of marriage. Uh, these practices were considered natural, see, and not immoral. Now, this is very, very instructive. See, the people to whom Paul is writing here. See, the people to whom he was writing in uh, 1 Thessalonians. See, see, immorality was considered normal. It was not abnormal. It was normal. Now, see, I mention that uh, as we pick up now in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3. Now, you see, what, what uh, Paul does here is that, again, he goes in, uh, to this subject. Now, uh, this very, I uh, should mention this, that, say, a lot of times we think that in the New Testament that all the saved people were from nice middle-class homes, say, the average American home, you see, and that's the way a lot of times we look at it and we think about it as we study the Word of God. Now, now as we study the Bible and study the culture of the day, see, what we find out, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, that the New Testament church was made up of saved adulterers. That's what uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 says. It was made up of previous fornicators. It was made up of idolaters and thieves and drunkards and homosexuals, and homosexual prostitutes. You say, Pastor, I never heard that the New Testament church was made up of homosexual prostitutes. Read your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 9 and 10. Now, what we're getting at, see, that's what Paul says there. But see what he says, and such were some of you. Thank God you got saved. Your lives were changed. You really were uh, converted. Now, you see what he's saying? He's saying, and such were some of you. Some of you were homosexual prostitutes. Some of you were homosexuals, adulterers, fornicators, and uh, drunkards, and uh, thieves, and on and on it goes as you read the Word of God there. So, uh, that's the thing that we need to keep in mind as we study the Word of God. Now, say most of the time, say we do not study the Bible in the culture of the day. By the way, I've heard a lot of um, even well-known outstanding Bible teachers, they say we study the Bible in the culture of the day and really try to get a hold of the real meaning of the Word of God. I would take issue with them because they do not. See, very few really get into uh, the New Testament era and see what was going on in the New Testament church. Again, see, most of our preaching today is that we think, well, everybody in church is made up of nice people, really nice people. Uh, that's who, who the New Testament church was made up of. You know, a lot of nice people and uh, middle class people and uh, so forth. But say, that is not true as you study 
the Word of God, and especially the culture of the day. Now, uh, as you read the Word of God uh, here in uh, uh, Ephesians 5 and verse 3, but he says, but fornication. Now, that's the word, again, that refers to any form of sexual sin. Say, uh, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, homosexual uh, prostitutes. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse uh, uh, 3. Now, uh, so he says, but uh, fornication. Now, and what he's saying here, that this should never be named among you as a child of God. See, that is something you should not practice. Now, why does he mention it? Why does uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, 4 and verse 3 said, uh, this is the will of God that you should abstain from fornication. See, it was a common everyday sin in the New Testament days. Now, number two, he says, in all uncleanness. Now, uncleanness doesn't have to do with washing your hands or anything like that. What it's talking about is being unclean in relation to the matter of uh, sexual sin. See, immorality, uh, anything along that line. See, uncleanness is referring to being dirty in the sight of God, in the moral realm, in the matter of impurity, you see, and that's what it is talking about. So he says that now, now this uncleanness, see, all of this uh, kind of sexual sin and immorality, whatever that might be, say that should never be a part of a child of God, somebody who's saved by uh, God's grace. And then the third thing he mentions here is the matter of covetousness. Now, um, what he's talking about here is not coveting money. Now, uh, as we pointed out many times in the Word of God, you have to study this word in its context to find out what it is talking about. Now, coveting here, or covetousness, as you read about it uh, here in the Word of God, say refers to a desire for sexual sins. That's what it's talking. not talking about, about money. You see, uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, uh, Exodus chapter uh, 20, and we read there uh, in verse 17, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's maid servant. Thou shalt not covet thy uh uh, thy neighbor's man servant. So now, you see, when you study this out in the Bible, now, by the way, it does talk about money, you know, and that's condemned in the Bible, the sin of covetousness, where someone just has this desire for money, and they're living for money, and that's all they want to live for, and their whole life revolves around money. But now, see, in the context here, it is not talking about uh, money, but it's talking about uh, sinful desires in the sexual area. See, someone who is hooked on pornography, what's their problem? They have this desire and this overwhelming desire. They can't get away from pornography and uh, uh, things along that line. Now, see, that's what he's talking about here. Now, these are three sins that he denounces here in uh, the Word of God. See, the matter of fornication, the matter of uncleanness, and the matter of covetousness, and then he goes on in verse 3, and he says, Let it not be, say, once named among you. Now, now, what he's talking about here, say, before you were saved, that was common. You were all involved in this garbage and all this uh, uh, wickedness and, and impurity and promiscuity and so forth. See, uh, that's the way you used to live before you were saved. But now that you are saved, he says, let it, let it not one time, one time be named among you. See, uh, this should, uh, should never characterize the life of the children of God. See, as he says in verse 3, as becometh saints. See, in other words, now you're a saint. In other words, again, that word saint is the word sanctification, uh, the word holiness, all related together, separated from sin 
unto God. And now he said, see, you're a saint. See, you've been saved by the grace of God. Now, uh, since you've been saved as a result of the grace of God, say, uh, these sins should never one time be named among you as a child of God. Couldn't be any clearer, amen? It's very clear and obvious what the Bible is saying here. Then he mentions three more in verse 4. He has three in verse 3, and then he has three more in verse 4, and he says, neither uh, filthiness. Now, the filthiness that he's referring to here, again, has nothing to do with washing your hands or anything like that. But what it's talking about here uh, in the Word of God is uh, filthy speech, see, or you might say uh, filthy jokes. Now, again, as I've said many times, see, a lot of times people say, oh, the Bible doesn't apply to my life. Yeah, it doesn't apply to your life because you don't read the Bible. So you read the Bible, and the Bible says here, you should never be involved in telling dirty jokes. So you should never be involved in telling uh, dirty stories, anything along that line. See, that's to uh, totally out of the will of God. Uh, filthy speech. Now, we know that in our society, that's very, very common. See, for people to tell off-color jokes, radio, television, I mean, you know, television is full of it, even people on radio, and many times the dirtier and the filthier they can be, the more popular they are and the more people listen to them. As someone has said, today nothing is sacred. The language of the gutter is uh, freely used in books and broadcast vulgar talk that would have been considered pornographic a generation ago is now commonplace. Now, Christians watch it on television, hear it on radio, read things that they don't even blush at anymore, see, as if there's nothing wrong with it. Now, see, what Paul is talking about here in verse 4, uh, neither filthiness, see, that matter uh, there of dirty jokes or filthy language. Now, see, a Christian should never be accused of telling a dirty joke. See, a Christian should never be accused of uh, talking about or telling a dirty story. Now, you say, well, pastor, how can you say that? That's what the Bible says. See, that's what it says right here in the Bible. See, that, that should never characterize a child of God. By the way, uh, everybody knows that. There's no question about that. Then the next thing he mentions in verse 4, nor foolish talking. See, uh, those who demonstrate, it actually refers to fools talking, uh, who demonstrate by what they say and what they talk about that really demonstrates they are an absolute fool. They are a fool. They're, de and de uh, they're dealing with uh, foolish uh, talk. And they demonstrate that by the language that they use. And when people especially use immoral language, that shows that in God's sight, they are a fool in the sight of God. Then the next thing he mentions here, in verse 4, is jesting. And that's a uh, language that really does not honor the Lord. Now, and see, and all of this, what Paul is talking about in this paragraph, in this section, in the Word of God, you see, what he's talking about is in relation to the context of impurity. So what, what he's talking about, say, this should never be once named among you as a child of God. Now, see what he goes on in verse 4 and says, um, which uh, are not convenient. That, that means that whenever these things are characteristic of a Christian, whenever a Christian is guilty of any of these things, that is totally out of place for any child of God. There's no excuse for it. It's totally out of place uh, here, and as he says here, uh, which are not Convenient. That simply means that they're out of place. See, they should not, uh, a Christian should not talk this way, and a Christian should not uh, act this way. Now, he goes on here in verse 4, and uh, he says, here's the way you ought to talk. 
See, if you are a Christian, here's the thing that should characterize your speech and my speech and uh, our lives. He says, but rather giving thanks. Now, the giving of thanks. In other words, see, we ought to always praise the Lord. We ought to always be honoring the Lord by our conduct and by our uh, speech. See, we ought to honor the Lord and uh, 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 say those things that are pleasing to the Lord. Now, if you hurriedly turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're talking about prayer. See, we're talking about praying in the will of God. If I'm hooked on pornography, if I'm watching something I shouldn't watch, if I'm reading something I should not read, God will not hear my prayer. And then, of course, that famous verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we read here in verse 18. And the Bible says, in everything give thanks. But now, see, we're talking about the will of God. For this is the will of God. Now we're talking about the will of God. The Bible has a lot to say about the will of God. And the Bible says, in everything, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, in other words, say, this is God's will for your life and in my life. And it says, in everything, not necessarily for everything and so forth. And uh, as time goes on, we could go into that passage and look at that in a little more detail. But you see, uh, it's always God's will. In everything, give thanks. Why? This is the will of God. You say, Pastor, everything has gone wrong, and I have all these difficulties in my life. Well, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the Bible says, In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God of God. Now, if I go around complaining all the time, see, uh, if I go around in a negative attitude all the time, see, God will not hear my prayer, much less answer my prayer. See, if I'm always negative and caustic and uh, so forth, see, um, and I'm never uh, thankful. See, we ought to be thankful as God's children from the moment we get up in the morning till the moment we go to bed at night. How much we have to be thankful for. See, in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God. Now, you see, he says here in Ephesians 5 in verse 4, but rather you, your speech ought to be characterized by praising God. And thanking God. Boy, how we all have a lot to be thankful for this morning. Amen? How many people do not have the health to be in service this morning? How many people are in nursing homes, hospitals, you name it. You see, and uh, uh, so forth. How we need to thank God for so many of his manifold blessings that he's given to all of us as God's uh, uh, children. Now, um, now, he gives two reasons why everybody should abstain from sexual sins and why every child of God ought to live uh, a pure life. Now, he gives two reasons for it. Now, first of all, in verse 5. Now, now you see what we're getting at. Say, this was the New Testament era. These were the people that Paul was ministering to. Even before we go into that, turn quickly in your Bible to Acts chapter 19. Because, see, this is talking here about Ephesus. And if you turn over to Acts chapter 19, you see what Paul was dealing with uh, in uh, Ephesus. Now, in uh, Acts chapter uh, 19 and uh, verse 27. Now, see, this is the city of uh, Ephesus. See, this is the background of the book of the Ephesians, the city of Ephesus. Now, see, in Acts 19 and verse 27, he says that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, and that's the craft of making idols, worshiping idols. See, Paul was in this city, see, in preaching, but also that the temple of the great goddess, not God, not a male god, but the female god, goddess Diana, should be despised. 
You see, and her magnificence should be destroyed whom all Asia and the world worships Diana, the goddess, a woman, a woman God. And then in verse 28, the last part of verse 28, they, the people cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Look down in verse 34. And by the space of two hours, they cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Now, see, what we're getting at, see, this was the background. They were worshiping not a male god, but the female goddess Diana. If you have a good Bible dictionary, you turn to a picture and you see your picture and right away it's associated with lewdness. Very similar to the sex god that in the Old Testament we've been studying about on Wednesday night, they set up inside the Jewish temple. Now here, say all the world, everybody is worshiping Diana, the goddess. See, the goddess uh, uh, Diana. Now, as you look here, it, uh, verse 5 of Ephesians chapter 5. He says, For this ye know. Now you see, Paul had to do a lot of teaching and preaching and instructing. This was the background that uh, many of them came out of. They, they actually worshipped a female goddess. See, and all of the immorality associated with that. In fact, they, they tell us that her, see, they said uh, the whole world worships her. And uh, I am told, as you study about this, that uh, her temple in the city of Ephesus at that time, at that time, was considered one of the great, magnificent places of the world. It's one of the seven wonders of the world in ancient history was a temple of Diana, the goddess, in the city of Ephesus. So uh, that's the background here. Say no middle class, no nice people, basically, that he's uh, dealing with when he say, uh, went to the city of Ephesus. See, um, uh, these were people that were steeped in paganism and immorality. Now, in verse 5, he says, For this ye know. Now, this is something that, that you know because you're saved and you know as a child of God. Say Ephesians 5 and verse 5. That know. Say, Lana, somebody needs to write a book. <laughs> if I had time, I would. On the little words in the Bible. Say, here's the word know. Say, not some. But no, see, and uh, so in Ephesians 5 and verse 5, the Bible says, For this ye know that no, not one, whoremonger. Now, whoremonger refers to somebody who practices all types of sins. Adultery, fornication, homosexuality, homosexual prostitution, prostitutes, all types. Uh, you put it all in that category is a whoremonger. Now, the Bible says, no whoremonger nor unclean uh, person. Now, uh, we know, again, as we've already studied in the Word of God, that unclean person here is talking about someone who is characterized by sexual sins. Now, keep in mind, what we're talking about is prayer, see, and the will of God, see. And um, the Bible says that, if we don't do God's will, we don't pray according to God's will, he doesn't hear us. Now, it is clearly God's will for every child of God to be a pure person. If I am not a pure person, God will never, ever even hear my prayer. You say, well, pastor, uh, he's not going to answer. No, he's not going to answer. He's not even going to hear our prayers unless we are pure. Now, that should speak to our hearts uh, uh, people watch things they, that are impure. People read and watch and listen to things that are absolutely uh, obscene. But now he says um, in verse 5, And this ye know that no, N-O, say, whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man. Now all of these are referring to people that are involved in sexual sins and sexual immorality. Now keep in mind, in the New Testament, it was commonplace. All of these type sins were very, very common in uh, the New Testament. 
Uh, uh, much could be said about that, and we could go into a lot of detail. Uh, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater. Why? See, someone who has this desire for sexual sin. See, uh, someone who has this uncontrollable desire for impurity. See, as we study the Word of God, see, the Bible says it is idolatry. Now, what does that mean? It is idolatry. See, that's the thing they worship. They worship the goddess Diana. People today are worshiping. That is their God, the God of immorality, the God of sex, the God of impurity. I have to watch that filthy show. I have to listen to all that impurity and vulgar uh, things in our society. No, see, the Bible says that's, that is idolatry. See, and by the way, uh, I'm sure we all realize that is a major sin in America today. See, immorality is not a minor sin in America today. Adultery is not a minor sin. It's a major sin. Fornication is not a minor sin. It is a major sin in America today. And hardly anybody ever preaches the Word of God in relation to this matter. See, because we don't study the Bible. Now, it says, you see, that is idolatry. See, that's someone gets, uh, goes down and they worship it. See, that is their God. They serve it. They worship it. They spend money on it. You see, that's what he's saying here. See, and what he's talking about here are sexual sins. See, and what he's saying here is these sexual sins are uh, covetousness and idolatry. In other words, that is the idol. That is the thing that I am worshiping. That is my idol. And specifically what he's talking about here is sexual sin. To show you how bad it is in America, see, nobody preaches against adultery in America today. There are some well-known preachers in America that will never, ever preach a sermon about adultery. There are some well-known preachers in America that will never ever preach a sermon about fornication. See, they'll never do it. Show you how bad it is. A few years ago, well, uh, someone that I was acquainted with to a certain degree, and he's an outstanding uh, preacher of the Word of God, and he had a, a nationally syndicated radio broadcast. He was on stations all across the country, and he had a sermon as he was teaching the Bible, like here in the Word of God. By the way, a lot of, a lot of expositors, they come to a, 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 a passage like this in the Bible, and believe it or not, they just skip over it. Isn't that something? So they just skip over it. They never talk about it. And uh, so anyway, uh, and he was not uh, a radical. He was not a, a legalist. I mean, he's the nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. I mean, he's really a nice guy, a friendly guy, and uh, not, a, not a mean guy in any way, shape, or form. But he was a Bible preacher. He's a pastor of a Baptist church, and he had the nationwide broadcast. And um, he had a sermon, just like this morning, going through the book of Ephesians about adultery. And the Christian radio network that he was on said, we must delete your message on adultery. They said, we will not air it. You see, because it's too strong. Well, what's he preaching? He's just preaching the Bible. I thought, by the way, isn't that part of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not commit adultery? Isn't that something that the Bible clearly teaches? See, and believe it or not, they stopped him. Well, that broadcast, they deleted it because he was preaching about adultery. That, that's what I'm saying. See, it's not only accepted outside the church, but all this garbage many times is accepted even inside the church. But now here's what we're getting at in verse 5. See, that person does not have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now, what does that mean? Say, anybody who practices these sins. Now, not somebody falls into it. Somebody who practices it now. See, the Bible says they will never 
inherit the kingdom of God. They will never go to heaven. Why? John 3, 3. In order to enter God's kingdom, you have to be born again. That's the only way you can enter the kingdom of God. See, now, what, what Paul's talking about here, see, you know what he's saying uh, very clearly and very basically here uh, in the Word of God is that, you see, you know that that person is not saved. Now, again, the context, very important. Paul is preaching in Ephesus. All of these people were involved in all of these dark, dirty sins that we are talking about this morning in the Word of God. Now, see, uh, and thank God, by the way, this is a great church of Ephesus. This is what the book uh, Church at Ephesus is written to here, and you read about the founding of it over there in Acts uh, 19, uh, the, and the city that pro, uh, the prominent god, uh, god was the goddess uh, Diana. Now, um, the thing uh, about it, see, as we uh, study the Word of God, is that, see, what Paul is saying, anybody who practices that, now, anybody who practices it, even though they made a profession of faith, they'll never get to heaven. They'll never get to heaven. They'll never be saved. Why? Because, see, that conduct indicates that they have never really repented, and that conduct indicates they have never been saved. They do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, see what he says in verse 5. So he says, Hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. See, they will never enter God's kingdom. They will never go to heaven someday. Why? Because this type of a conduct indicates very, very clearly that they are not saved, that they do not know the Lord as their uh, uh, Savior. Now, the second thing he says about it in relation uh, to why someone should not uh, uh, commit these sins, continue uh, in uh, uh, these uh, uh, sins is found in the next verse, verse 6. Say, let no man deceive you with vain words. Now, that's an empty word. See, uh, a word that has absolutely no meaning. Now, what is he saying? Let no man deceive you. Now, say, and by the way, he says the same thing in other contexts when you study about immorality in the Word of God. This is not the only place where he says that. I wish we had time to go into the other places in the Bible where he says, let no man deceive you. Now, what is he talking about? Let no man deceive you in the subject of sexual sins. That's what he's talking about. Don't let anybody deceive you. And uh, in this area, let no man deceive you with vain words because they're empty words. For because of these things, say, now what he's talking about are sexual sins, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, homosexual prostitutes, anything in that whole area of promiscuity. See, what does he say in verse 6? Because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. You study chapter 2, the children of disobedience are those who are not saved. See, and what he's saying, see, the wrath of God comes upon people who practice these sins. Now, again, what is very, very striking here in the Word of God, he says, for the wrath uh, 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 upon the, uh, these things cometh, say, the wrath of God. See, and actually that's the present tense. Now, uh, the only way we can figure that out is that, see, they're under the wrath of God now, but, see, it is so certain that they will be judged for that sin and experience the wrath of God. By the way, that's a strong expression, and that's another synonym of eternal hell. See, that, uh, and the, uh, the way you know that, say it's a present tense, is that it is so sure that they are undergoing, will undergo the judgment of God that, you see, it's as if the wrath of God has already fallen upon them from God's standpoint. Now, now might necessarily have uh, fallen upon them right now, but in the future it will, and that's the certainty of God. Now, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, the Bible says, Be not deceived. See, no fornicator or adulterer or homosexual specifically, 
1 Corinthians 6, 9, nor homosexual uh, prostitute has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. See, he repeats that same thing, you see, uh, there, that they will not enter into the kingdom of God. He said, don't be deceived. See, adulterers and fornicators and sex addicts are not saved and they're not on their way to heaven according to the Bible. Now, and then um, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 6, we saw last week that God, the Bible says, is the avenger of all such. Now, in the context, talking about sexual sins. Say, God is the avenger of all such. That means, say, God will punish those who are involved. Uh, you take uh, somebody who molests a, a child, and I believe that national law came about right here in our backyard, down in, I believe it was Manal uh, Manalapin, you see, Megan's Law, see, where the guy, I guess, uh, creeped into the house through the window and molested the girl, and I guess actually killed the, law, the girl, and that's right here in our own backyard. And uh, someone might say, well, are those child molesters ever going to be judged by God? Is God ever going to be a deal with people like that? Yeah, the Bible says they'll spend eternity in hell, say, separated from God. You say, uh, that God is the avenger. He's the one who will punish uh, all such. So that's uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 6. And then in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, the Bible says, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. See, God honors marriage. Somebody says, well, um, it's just a piece of paper. Well, that's a sign you're on your way to hell if you say that. Because, see, it's an institution ordained by God Almighty. And that's the institution of marriage. Now, I might say a word about that. Somebody is shacking up with somebody, and they're living with somebody. And, uh, see, it's not a, not a good thing, obviously. It's contrary to the Word of God. That's a sin of uh, fornication, adultery, and so forth. But what happens when I go to the hospital? Who's your husband? Well, um, I don't have a husband. And I notice your name, uh, my name is different than my husband's name. And so, to make a long story short, who winds up paying for their hospital bill? Let me ask that question again. Who winds up paying for their hospital bill? Well, they say, well, you see, you and me. See, we're the ones that are paying that bill to that hospital to cover that patient through our tax money. But uh, so the Bible is real clear. Say, marriage is honorable in all. The bed undefiled. God, uh, Jesus Christ had a lot to say about marriage. No question about that as you read the, uh, the Word of God. But now the Bible says, but you see, whoremongers, that's fornicators and adulterers, say, uh, Hebrews 13, verse 4, God will judge. Now, over and over again, what we're pointing out in the Word of God is that God's specific judgment is upon those who commit this sin, and certainly in the uh, life to come. Now, in uh, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, it talks about, the, the roll call there of people who will experience a second death. It's the roll call there of people who will go to hell. Revelation 21 and verse 8. And on that list are whoremongers. Say, the ones who will go to hell, according to Revelation 21 and verse 8, are fornicators, adulterers, homosexuals, and, and the whole list there. So uh, what we're uh, s simply uh, saying, you see, the Bible says here that God's wrath abideth upon those that commit these sins. You say, well, well, pastor, you're real strong. Uh, pastor, uh, why preach that? We're just preaching the Bible, amen? We're going verse by verse, clause by clause in the Bible. 
We're trying to help us see what the Bible says. Not what Pastor Gent says, but what the Bible says. So um, he says, Has any inheritance in the kingdom of God? Let no man deceive you, verse 6, with vain words. For because of these things, see, these specific sins, you say, sexual sins, sexual impurity, because of these things cometh the wrath of God. Some would say, well, I didn't know God was a God of wrath. Well, he does judge sin. And the Bible says the wrath of God, we read about it here, upon the children of disobedience. So uh, that's very clear in the word of God. See, God's wrath is upon those that uh, commit these sins, very clear in, in the word of God. And then in verse 7, he says, and be ye not therefore partakers with them. In other words, don't have any fellowship with somebody who is of this ilk. Say, do not have any fellowship with somebody who commits these sins. Now, now I wish the Bible maybe was a little more moderate, but see what it says here, be not. Now again, that's clear. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. See, and you should never be involved with their sin, nor should you ever be involved with them. Now, by the grace of God, we're to witness to everybody, but we're never to play with a person's sin. We're never to play. Now, we can witness to sinners, but don't play around with sinners. Because if you do, you get in trouble. You see, and how many have gotten in trouble? Amen. So he says here, be ye not therefore partakers with them. Now, it's very clear. So you need to be separated. Now, everybody in your community is doing it. Everybody says it's fine, it's right. That's even part of our worship to the goddess Diana and the greatest temple in the world at that particular time. Well, uh, especially in Asia Minor. Well, he says, be ye not therefore partakers with them. And then he says, for sometimes, verse 8, for, some time, for ye were sometimes in darkness. Now, you see what he's saying? He's not talking about middle-class America. It's not what he's saying. He's saying, all you people were nice people before you got saved. He didn't say that. He says here, for ye were sometimes in darkness. See what he's saying? That's the way you used to live before you got saved. You see? And now he says in verse 8, but now. See, you have that great little word, but. But now ye are light in the Lord. Now walk as children of light. Light in the Bible refers to righteousness and so forth. So you see what he's saying very clearly there? in the Word of God. See, that's the way you used to live. Now, see, as Christians, we need to put off the old and put on uh, the new. And uh, we're just introducing this subject. We'll have so much to say about that because Paul has so much to say about that in the book of Ephesians about putting on the new man and so forth. But see, uh, here he says, uh, but now ye are light in the Lord, say, because you're saved, and walk as children of of light. Now you're saved, you ought to walk as children of light. In other words, before you got saved, you lived together. How many people here this morning know of somebody that is living with somebody and they're not married? Raise your hand. Even some people put up two hands. Say, uh, but anyway, uh, see, now, you see, what we're getting at, see, in the Word of God, see, once you get in the light, you get married, amen? You stop living together, you get married. Gee, uh, the Bible says marriage is honorable. It's great to be married. There's nothing wrong with marriage. You see, the Bible is very, very clear. See, before you got saved, that's the way you lived. Now, after you get saved, people get married. They don't live together uh, and not uh, be uh, married. Now, um, see, the book of Ephesians 
is one of the greatest books in the Bible about how to overcome sexual sins. We hear a lot about it today, but a lot of times we really don't study the Bible. See, this is one of the greatest books in all the Bible on how to overcome sexual sins. And someone says, well, Pastor, I've heard the book of Ephesians taught, and uh, it's in the heavenlies, and we have uh, the, the wealth of the child of God, and the walk of the child of God, and the warfare of the child of God, all in the book of Ephesians. We have the riches, our riches in Christ, then our responsibilities. We have our, our doctrine, and then we have our duty. But it's one of the greatest books in the Bible on how to overcome sexual temptation. Now, we're just introducing it this morning. Uh, Lord willing, the Lord doesn't come, we'll get into it next Sunday morning. But now the first step is found in chapter 1 in verse 7. Now here's the first step. Say someone wants to overcome sexual sin. What's the first step? Ephesians 1 and verse 7. In whom... We have redemption, see, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his, um, according to the riches of his grace. That's the first step in overcoming sexual sin in a person's life is a need to be redeemed. Okay, now, what does the word redeem mean? See, the essence of the word redeemed means to be set free. By the way, I heard a lot of preachers preaching about it, and I think they missed the boat. See, redemption means I'm set free. Redemption means I am liberated from the penalty of my sin. And included in Bible redemption is I am not only redeemed, set free from the penalty of my sin, but praise God, I am set free from the power of sin in my life. And that's all through the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, and we read that very clearly in uh, the word of God. And then he goes on, say, we need redemption. We need the power to be liberated. And that only comes through redemption. And then he says, even the forgiveness of sins. And then the way to be liberated is to know, K-N-O-W, know your sins are forgiven. You see, and these people to whom Paul is writing, he's saying, see, you have been redeemed. You do know that your sins have been forgiven. Now, again, we're getting into the Bible and getting into some things that we probably have never seen before. Now, to whom is Paul writing? To whom is he saying this? The worshipers of the goddess Diana. Those that were involved in adultery and fornication and homosexuality and prostitution. See, we already saw that in the Word of God. These are the people to whom he's writing. What have they been liberated from? Sexual sin. See, Jesus Christ gave them the power to overcome that sexual uh, sin. That's redemption. And then uh, the matter of uh, forgiveness. Now, in 1 Corinthians 6.10, Paul says, ye are washed, and you're sanctified, and you're justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus, by the Spirit of our God. Now, to whom did he say you're washed? In the context, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, adulterers, fornicators, homosexuals, homosexual prostitutes, drunkards, and thieves. He said, see, you wash, you're washed. And the tense there, where there's a time in your life when you came to Jesus Christ and you realized he died on the cross to wash away your filthy sin. You see, and you're washed. And all that filthy sin... Adultery, fornication, homosexuality, homosexual prostitutes, all right there in the, in the verse. Say, that's what Paul says, praise God, you're washed from. That's what, and thank God you are now justified in the sight of God. 
Another verse we've quoted a million times is uh, Psalm 51 and uh, verse 7. And David there says, wash me and I shall be whiter, not white, whiter, whiter than snow. What sin is David talking about? By the way, that's quoted in Romans 4 too. What is a specific sin there in Psalm 51 and verse 7 that David says, I want to be washed and God, you wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. David is talking about sexual sin. He's not talking about stealing a cookie from grandmother's cookie jar. He is specifically talking about sexual sin. Now, how can I be redeemed? How can I be forgiven? See, Ephesians 1, 7, it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. See, on the cross, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, died to forgive us of all sin. That includes all sexual sins. His blood avails the vilest sinner. Amen? See, and that's why he died, and that shows his love for you and for me. Why? Because he died on the cross for our sins. That is why he shed his blood. See, the blood of Jesus Christ, you see, cleanses from all sin, and that's even including a child molester. That's even including a homosexual. That's even including an adulterer and a for all sexual uh, uh, sins. Now, and again, I uh, wish we had more time. We're just introducing it. And uh, what, how to be liberated from sexual sin. See, they got a hold of these people whom he was preaching. You see, chapter 2 and verse 4. But God... Look at Ephesians 2 and verse 4. Who is rich in mercy. Praise God. He can make the vilest sinner queen. He's rich in his mercy. He does not give me what I deserve. I deserve hell. Now, and then he goes on and he says, is rich in mercy for his great love. Not his love. His great love. You see, uh, wherewith he loved us. That's the cross. God's great love was revealed on the cross of Calvary. We see it very clearly here in the Word of God. Now, say, to whom is he writing? Say, who are these people? Nice, middle-class Americans? No. He was talking to people who were plagued. They were immersed in sexual sin. Look in um, verse 3 of chapter 2 who uh, also we all had our conduct, our conversation. Also, we all had our conversation times past, what does Paul say? In the lust of the flesh. See, the backdrop of this are those who commonly lived immoral lives. Okay, uh, look what he says in the last part of verse 3. And all of us, were by nature, say, the children of wrath, even as others. Now, uh, and then he says, but thank God, say, verse um, 4, for his uh, mercy, his, who, he's rich in mercy, his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, he made us alive. What's wrong with the sex fiend? They're dead in sin. By the way, they're not sick. They're spiritually dead. That's what the Bible says. See, a lot of times say, well, people are sin sick. No, they're not sin sick. They're sin dead. That's what the Bible says. You see, chapter uh, 2 and verse 1. For you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. See, we weren't sick. We were dead before we came to Jesus. And then he says uh, in verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, that's quickened us together uh, with Christ, say, praise God, by grace you're saved. Amen? Say, God doesn't give us what we deserve. You see, we could go on in this great chapter and so many things, but 
See, what happened to these people who were dominated by sexual sins? See, that's the book of Ephesians. We're just introducing it this morning. We'll get into a lot more detail as we go on in the book of Ephesians. So, but now, you see, uh, what he's saying here, that's the way you lived. But when I came and preached, you got a hold of the mercy of God. How that God still loves you in relation to your sin. God loves you. You say, and uh, you come to Christ. You say, and he'll show mercy to you if you repent and come to Christ. Number two, Paul preached, not the love of God, but the great love of God. How Jesus Christ died on that cross. He shed his blood to forgive us of all of our sin. See, what I'm talking about, that's the first step in being delivered from sexual sin. You have to know you've been redeemed and you have to know your sins are forgiven. If you don't know your sins are forgiven, you don't know you're redeemed, you'll never be liberated uh, from that sin. And then number three, they not only got a hold of the mercy of God, they not only uh, got a hold of the love of God, but then they got a hold of the grace of God. That's why we sang that song. We sing it, but we don't mean it. Amazing grace that saved a really nice guy like me. No, it says, amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. You see, that's the grace of God. See, how can somebody be delivered from sexual sin? The first step is to get a hold of the mercy, the love, and the grace of God. To be redeemed, to be set free, see, from sin's power and penalty in my life, and to know I've been forgiven of my sin. And that's why these people went on to live for Christ and be great testimonies for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, because they got a hold of redemption, forgiveness, mercy, the love of God, and they got a hold of the grace of God. Well, that's the first step. You see, uh, I trust that God will speak to our hearts. Romans 10, 21. The Bible says, All the day long have I stretched forth my hands unto thee. And thank God, Jesus Christ is stretching forth his hands in love and saying, come to me, I want to forgive you. Come to me, I want to give you a new life. Romans chapter 10 and verse uh, 21. And those hands are outstretched in love today. And if you come to Jesus Christ as a sinner, someone who knows you're a sinner, a repentant sinner, praise God, you can experience the mercy of God and the love of God and the grace of God, and you can be redeemed and set free from sin and praise God through the blood of Jesus Christ, you can be forgiven of all of your sin. If we as God's children have compromised in this area, we've let some dirty things come into our lives, how we need to repent, how we need to get our life right with the Lord. See, next week we'll be pointing out, see, if you're really saved, you have a new life in Jesus Christ. Praise God, you have new life. And he wants you to live like a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Our Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts, uh, help us, and Lord, help us to realize what we're simply doing is studying about the will of God. And Lord, help us to realize that you tell us that if we do not pray according to the will of God, Lord, help us to realize our prayers will never be heard, much less answered. And Lord, help us to realize it's always God's will to be a pure person. Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 1 Peter 1, 16, be ye holy, for I am holy. Philippians 4 and verse 8. 
whatsoever things are pure, think on these things. Lord, help us, we pray, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.